Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. He covers everybody, everything under his wings. Praise the Lord. We are sheltered. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you this morning. We thank you for the testimonies that will come as a result of the prayers. We cast our care upon you, Lord, because you care for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have taken care of every need, every situation, and only ask us to believe and receive. And we do that right this moment in Jesus' name. And we bless you for it. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much, Tim. Great as always. Appreciate it. And uh, Jody, great job. Praise the Lord. And? Come on, brother. I don't know if there's any batteries in the battery in the field or something. It's showing it's lit up. showing the light is lit, so I don't know. Just, okay, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Anyway, thank you, Jody. Great job. And thank you, Eric. They're standing there. Did a great job. Everything worked well. Praise the Lord. In spite of me, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Anyway, I appreciate them so much stepping up and taking care of the the duties that normally Suzanne and uh, Mike would do, and they're off having a good time in Lake Tahoe, and God bless them. They're having fun. I saw the, the view from their room. It's beautiful. It's mountains. And, you know, part of the country there. A place, great place to visit. And, uh, so, praise the Lord. God bless all of you for being here. Appreciate uh, everyone's worship, your prayer requests, your testimonies. And all of you that are with us online, God bless you. We appreciate you being a part of the service and joining with us this morning in our uh, seeking first the kingdom of God. Amen. And you're an important part of the services. We know you're not here physically, but you are here with us in spirit, and that's, that's important to all of us. So we appreciate it. God bless you wherever you are, and may the Lord be with you and uh, you experience his grace, his mercy, and his Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. You know, right with all the weird uh, stuff going on, people are having more uh, out, like outpatient surgeries and stuff. I was uh, with family members that some have, and I just thought it's you know it's cheaper and and it might be more convenient. But I'm going to give you a couple of hints on what you uh, you may want to consider or want to re rethink your decision about that. And that is that uh, some things to if, if you're thinking about having this uh, outpatient kind of surgery. You might want to uh, check the place out a little bit. And if the surgical tools have the Home Depot logo uh, imprinted on them, think about it. Or if you notice that the anesthesiologist is holding a hammer, you would maybe want to rethink that outpatient surgery. Praise the Lord. Or if the oxygen mask says property of American Airlines, it's not a good place to be having your surgery done. Or the defibrillator, which is always an important thing for surgery, in surgeries, and uh, if it's a fork and electrical outlet, don't go there. <laughs> Those are really lame, but hey, praise the Lord. I deserve your uh, disgust. I don't approve of medical drugs. I've seen too many of them get elected. <laughs> okay. Here we go. We'll simplify this. Knock, knock. Control freak. Cut, cut, okay, now you say control freak who? Praise God. Okay, so are we? Are you going to pull up scripture? Well, praise the Lord, because I thought I was going to have to do this, and I was. Okay, well, double duty.
love my wife, but I know her skills. That's not one of them. Amen. And it's because it's not mine either. I mean, I, you know, my whole answer to everything I told Eric, they're asking questions. I said, have you turned it off and turned it back on? Because that's all I know how to do. When it doesn't work, I shut it off, turn it back on, and hope something will happen while I had it off. Praise the Lord. So God is great, and I appreciate all the testimonies and the sharing that you did this morning because it does touch, as always, uh, just what I want to share with you this morning. And uh, let's begin with Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. And for the most part, I'm going to stay in Hebrews, although I will deviate to a couple of other uh, scriptures, but most of it's going to stay right in Hebrews. <clears throat> so I may repeat my, uh, uh, some of these scriptures, but it's so that we get it settled in our minds uh, and understand exactly what the Lord is saying. So in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Let me repeat this now. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So now let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So the more we the more we understand the power of the blood of Jesus, the deeper and the more intimate our relationship with God becomes. It's when we come to the realization that it's through the blood of Jesus that we stand holy and righteous. Amen. It's through the blood of Jesus that God sees us perfect, just as Jesus. Amen? And because of that, it's that, that is the, the impetus that brings us to the place where we understand that we are set free from dead works. Amen? We don't have to perform for God to try to win his favor or to try to get God to like us or for God to accept us and give us approval. Because Jesus did all of that for us. Praise the Lord. So what makes a good work a dead work? Praise the Lord. Anytime, amen, we're trying to do something to get God's approval. A dead work is simply anything we do with the motive of trying to earn favor with God or trying to please people. Amen. When we experience God's unconditional love and acceptance through Jesus, we can rest in his grace and stop working. Stop worrying. Stop freaking out. Stop being afraid. Stop the pain of human effort to earn favor with God. Praise the Lord. That's what religion is all about. It's what it's always been about. It's what it will always be about. This is about a relationship, and the only way we can have this relationship is by understanding Jesus has made us accepted in the beloved. We, he's made us accepted to God. Acceptable. Amen. Hebrews 4 Verses 10 and 11. Amen. For whosoever, or excuse me, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So the real true freedom and liberty comes when we finally accept the perfect atonement that's given to us through Jesus. There's absolutely nothing we can do to improve our right standing relationship with God. I mean, this is where so many people, young people, old people, religious uh, people of faith even, they get so hung up. They, they're so bound by their efforts and their all the energy they're pouring into trying to make themselves perfect, not understanding that Jesus has already established our, our, our relationship, our right standing relationship with God. Hebrews 10, 14. 
And this is a scripture, Hebrews 10, 14, we'll be going back and forth over this throughout the message this morning because it's so critical. But Hebrews 10, 14 tells us that Jesus has made us perfect. By, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's us. Jesus, by one offering, that, that cross, that death, burial, and resurrection, that one offering of his blood has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified or set apart. That's us. For all, I mean, just if we just ever could grasp that one message, that one scripture, it would change everything in our lives. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Praise the Lord. We are perfect. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Not in word or deed here on earth. And we all know that because we'd be hypocrites to say that that scripture is true if it, if it was literally speaking about our human function here on earth. We are perfect, but not in word or deed here on earth. But we are made perfect in the sight of God through the sacrifice of Christ. Amen. That's where we have to get to the place where we can disconnect from the physical and connect to the spiritual. Amen. What got born again was our spirit. Our flesh didn't get changed at all. We have to even renew our mind to the Word of God in order to get our flesh to do anything that's in agreement with the Word of God. Amen? And so then we are able to enter into His holy presence. Why? Because He perfected us. And the way God sees us is just like Jesus. He opened the veil so that we could enter into the holiest of holies, so that we could come into the presence of God without any fear of of repercussions or, or, or God's uh, anger or frustration with us or anything else. We're able to enter his holy presence. Amen. We are made perfect instruments of worship. Praise the Lord. When we worship here, we are perfect, perfect worshipers because God accepts it as spiritual worship because we are spirit. We are born again. Look at, uh, in James 1, uh, 5, he says that, Spiritual knowledge, amen, he tells us, uh, if you lack wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of me, and I'll give it to you, and upbraideth not. You know what that's, what he's saying is, if you, if you, uh, if you want to know, he's talking about spiritual wisdom there, if you look that up, the, the meaning is spirit, so we're talking about, if, if anybody needs more spiritual understanding or wisdom, Ask me, and I'll give it to you, and upbraid you not, or not ridicule you, or judge you, or condemn you, or find fault with you. If you want more depth in your spiritual relationship with God, ask him. And he'll give it to you, and he won't give it to you based on how good you're being at the moment you're asking for it. He'll give it to you based on what Jesus has already done to perfect you in the eyes of God. Amen? We're, we're perfect, Right? just not in our natural actions all the time. That's something that has to be dealt with through the renewing of the mind, amen, and coming into agreement with your spirit. But we're always going to be flawed because we have a flesh and blood body. Amen? So think about uh, when we're able to enter into his holy presence, it declares immediately that we are holy, that we're justified, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The same way the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement because he had been, uh, he had, a sacrifice had been offered for him so that he could enter in to the presence of God to bring the blood, to sprinkle the blood for the offering of the people of Israel. Amen? Remember, uh, Jesus told these, the, the Samaritan woman, they were arguing about or she was at least trying to argue about where was the right place to worship God. He said, you know, we, we worship here and y'all, you Jews worship there. And Jesus just stopped it right there and he said, you know, the day is coming when everyone that worships God will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now the spirit hadn't been poured out yet. So they were just going through ritualistic religious duties. But he said the day is coming and soon when everyone who truly worships God will worship him by the Spirit. Because they couldn't, the, the people of Israel could not come in personally to, to, 
to worship God. They had the only one that could do that was the high priest, and he went on their behalf, and he had to be sprinkled with the blood of all the offerings. Okay, so the book of Hebrews is speaking to Jews who believed that Jesus was the Son of God, manifest in the flesh, and yet because of persecution, religious persecution and pressures, they were reverting to the temple worship and rituals. They were going back to offering sacrifices for sin and performing works according to the law. Now, if you think about Christianity, I mean, we look at that and we think, good grief, what were they thinking? I mean, they saw Jesus. Well, what? tell me, I mean, the truth is, what does religion do? It brings you, hopefully, to Jesus where you get born again. And then what does it do? It takes you right back to the law. It, it does the same thing that they were doing. Amen? But the blood of Jesus had made them accepted. The writer of Hebrews explains to them, their works of the law are useless. Amen? They're dead works. So when they tell you, get rid of your TV, you know, or whatever it might be, you know what I'm saying? If they tell you, you've got to pray so many hours a day, you've got to do, I'm not saying don't pray, I'm saying praying is good, but you should be doing it out of a, your hunger for God or for your wanting to have the relationship with God, not for thinking that if I do this enough, then he'll like me or he'll, he'll, he won't punish me or something like that. Amen? So their works, their, those efforts, those Physical things that we do are absolutely worthless. They are what the scripture calls dead works. They're religion. And Jesus didn't come to give us a religion. He came to deliver us from the law, from the religion, to a relationship with Jesus. Now think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were open and they walked with God every day. They talked with him. They didn't, they, they didn't realize they were naked. They were, they were innocent. They were still doing stuff that by the law would have probably been considered wrong or, or, or bad, but there wasn't any law. There was just the grace of God. So they had this perfect relationship until they listened to the lies of the devil. Then they acted on those lies, and what happened? They become afraid. Why? Because now they have a guilty conscience. Now they have a consciousness of sin, which they'd never had before. It wasn't that they had never sinned before. It was they had no consciousness of it. It's like a little child. They can be little brats, but they don't know they're being brats because they have no consciousness of right and wrong and good and bad, right? So we don't hold them accountable the way we would somebody that's 12 or 14 years old. And this is how God looks at us. We are innocent. We have been considered innocent in the eyes of God. He doesn't see our sin. He doesn't know that we ever had sin. He's able to do that. He's able to just block it out like it never existed as far as the east is from the west, he says, right? Look at this, Hebrews 9 13 and 14. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. And so, the way religion is, for if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls with, and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. To get us back to that innocence where you just walk with God. You just don't have any fear of God. You don't have fear of anything else because you know God's there. He's going to take care of you. No consciousness of that act I just performed or that word that I just said is going to come back on me. It's going to come. It's going to, what goes around comes around. It's some kind of karma. That's BS. He's trying to get us back to the place where we have no consciousness of sin. Even when we fail, we're not thinking about the failure. We're thinking about his love for us. We're thinking about deliverance. We're thinking about what God wants to do in our lives. Amen? Blood of bulls and goats purified, and we just I just mentioned this a moment ago, it purified the flesh of the priest in order for him to enter the holiest of holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. But that blood didn't take a sin away. It didn't do away with the sin because... The reminder of sin every year was, in fact, the same sacrifice had to be made again. So it just reminded them there was a, always a consciousness of sin. It didn't deliver them from it. It didn't get rid of the sin. It just held back judgment for that sin for one more year. So there was always a consciousness of sin under the law. Well, is that not religion? 
I mean, I remember going to church and you'd sit there and go in feeling pretty good about yourself because I did get up and go to Sunday school or I went to church only to find out what a jerk I was and how much God hated my behavior and disliked me and all the other stuff. A conscious reminder of everything I already knew about myself, but was hoping to get delivered from, and all they're wanting to do is remind me, you're bad, you're bad, you're, you know, you don't do, you're, look, if you don't do this, you're, you see what I'm saying? That's religion. That's what the, the law was all about, to bring us to condemnation so that we would cry out to God for something that we couldn't do for ourselves. But once we have received that, now we're fools to go back to the law. Because all it does is bring back consciousness of sin. It does just the opposite of what Jesus came here to deliver us from. Amen? Hebrews 10 and 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins over and over and over constantly but the blood of Jesus cleanses the conscience of sin specifically it cleanses the conscience from dead works amen which means we don't have to hear this voice inside continually telling us if you don't do this if you don't do this if you don't do that then God won't be pleased with you the Hebrews were mixing law and grace through their works of law, they were in effect trying to improve on what the blood of Jesus had already accomplished. That is religion in any form. That's what we see today. Hebrews 10, 29. I mean, God wants us to truly be free. He doesn't want us walking around dragging a baggage of our failures and our weaknesses and our inabilities to be perfect. He has declared us perfect, and he wants us to see ourselves that way so we can live a life of freedom. This is the thing that we're supposed to be sharing with our children, with our grandchildren, with our friends, with the people. That, not God wants you to do this or God's going to get you for doing that. Look, out of this comes a desire to love God back, which will bring far more obedience than any law or all the laws could ever do. Because he's not asking you for it. You're just saying, I want to do this. Not because I think that it's going to leverage me somehow with you, but simply because I love you and I want to do something for you. Right? That's what God, that's the way God wants. Isn't that the way we want relationships? We don't want it, uh, we don't want it, uh, a, you know, you owe me. Well, Tim said it this morning. God will not be a debtor to any man. If, he tells us over and over, if they, if they ask you for your coat, give them your cloak too. In other words, he's saying, don't, don't let them feel like they've manipulated you something from you. Because he said, I won't let that happen with me. So how much more punishment, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? Now he's talking to Jewish people who had converted to Christianity, who had believed in Jesus. Amen. They were still Jews. They just weren't under the law anymore. And he's talking to them, and he says, how much worse punishment do you suppose? Now, they're thinking about the punishment that will come if I don't do this ritual, if I don't do that ritual. And he's saying, look, that's nothing. How much worse would it be for you to think that you will be, de will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God or rejected the one who can take away the need for all of that, amen, and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace, thinking that, look, all you did, Jesus, wonderful, but it wasn't quite enough. You need a little help from me. I mean, how ridiculous. They were mixing law and they were mixing grace. They were trying to improve on what Jesus had done. And it couldn't get any better. It could not get any better. Hebrews uh, 4 and 12. See, this, I mean, when we really understand this, it really is too good to be true. I mean, from a human perspective, it's like, this is insane. This is crazy. God's just giving this to us, even when he knows I'm going to screw it up. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and the discerning of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is what Tim talks about all the time. If you think you're hiding your sin, you're crazy. 
You might be, hide it, might be able to hide it from a neighbor, somebody down the street, but you're not hiding anything from God. He already knows, and he's already accepted you with all of that baggage. God knows your heart. He's able to discern between the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This is like Don said about, uh, uh, about Paul. What did Paul say? Well, my, my, my intentions are this, or my thoughts are this, but my intentions end up becoming something else. And it's a two-edged sword piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, which is the brain and your hum- you know, your born-again spirit. It's the, it's the conflict. And God knows the conflict. But he says, I'm choosing the spirit. I'm not choosing to believe what's being motivated by your brain, because we know whatever actions we're taking have to come through a thought. And he says, I'm not, I'm not judging you by the thoughts or the soulish realm. I'm judging you by the spirit which has made you perfect in my eyes. Amen? So the joints of the marrow, right? So the context of Hebrews chapter 6 through 10, actually, is that anything we do motivated by trying to earn favor with God or with other people, amen, are dead works. That's where the dead works comes in. They, they have no life giving to them. They, have, they don't bring anything. They're dead. Praise the Lord. So trying to improve our right standing with God, trying to impress men without spirituality, or trying to show them how spiritual I am through some action, through some deed. I mean, we hear it all the time. I heard a guy preaching this morning talking about all that he had done, you know, all this stuff that he had accomplished and everything. And I'm thinking, whoa, really? I'm not asking you to save me. All I need is point me to Jesus. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in everything about you. I mean, I understand sometimes our own lives, you know, we have to share things. But this was like, whoa, him and some other preacher that basically <laughs> stepped up and made things work for Jesus. <laughs> it's like Jesus needed it. Praise God. So in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. We read this uh, Hebrews 6, 1 in the opening. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. I'm, th- I'm, I'm telling you, church, I think this is exactly where we're at right now in, in natural time. That, and, okay, that's all. And of instruction about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So here the writer of Hebrews lists six foundational doctrines of Christ. Amen? Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgments. I'm not saying we shouldn't know those things. What he's saying is you should know those and let's move on. We don't need to keep going. I mean, there are churches where you'll hear the same message every single week, multiple times. And that's what he's saying. Okay, we need those. We need that. We need that revelation. But once we have that revelation, move on. You, you just don't keep beating the dead horse. You know, you don't keep going over the same thing forever. At some point, people are going to get it. And once they have, they have. They need to move on into maturity now. Amen. And so the the, the writer doesn't want to go back over the basics again. Instead, he wants to go on to teach them about something more deeply spiritual. Right? Jesus told his, uh, even his disciples, he said, there's some things I really would love to share with you, but you're not ready. You're not in the place spiritually where you could receive it. You don't have the ability to, for the revelation to have uh, any impact on you, right? So again, Hebrews 10, 14. Here's what Jesus is talking about. Let's move on from these six fundamental basic elements of Christianity, and let's move on to the deep things of the Spirit. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Perfection doesn't come through works. Perfection in the eyes of God comes only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, 9, and 10. salvation. For 
God is not un, not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. So he says, this is about salvation and them just loving the brethren. Right? Love one another as Christ loved us. Right? Love the body of Christ. That's, the, that's what he's saying. That's all I'm asking. Amen. Hebrews 7, 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. So if perfection were attainable under religion, right, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? the ironic priesthood could deliver you, then why did we need Jesus? Praise the Lord. So let's lay aside these elementary principles of the faith and talk about something much deeper. Something that now that we have the Spirit, we can receive. We can understand it. Something that requires a revelation from the Holy Ghost to even begin to comprehend and that is one offering, he has perfected you forever. By one offering, those that are sanctified, those that are saved. That's what Jesus was telling us. Through the Holy Spirit, through the writer of Hebrews, we need the basics, we've got the basics, now let's move on to the deep things of God. That is takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit. That's why when we share things like that with people that, uh, that are religious but not being led by the Spirit, they, they think you're just trying to get a free pass. It's not a free pass if God already gave the pass. I mean, it's, it's, it's not me trying to manipulate the Word of God. It's me just simply saying exactly what the Word of God says. And God's saying, good, isn't it? Isn't this something? This is, this is the God that you're believing in. This is the, the love of a God who has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness at no cost to you whatsoever except believe. Imagine living our lives without any shame, without any guilty conscience, without any thought of retribution from God, of it's just hugs and hugs and more hugs. Nothing based on your behavior whatsoever, simply based on your receiving it by faith from him, believing that he is the good God that he says he is, and then living your life accordingly. I promise you, yeah, you'll still screw up, I, I guarantee it. We're human. But you'll live a lot closer life to God than you ever could have under religion. Because you'll know when you screw up, he's still awful. He's still bad. He still loves me. He'll, I can still come back to him, the prodigal son. I can still come home. Praise the Lord. John 15, uh, 4 and 5. See, that six. Just kidding. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So our good works are supposed to be a natural expression of our love for God. Our good works are to be a natural expression of our abiding in the vine. Not trying to get something from God, just an outflow. Just, a, just an overflow of what we have in our relationship with God. It's not a requirement. He's not saying, do, 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 do. If you don't do these things, then you're in trouble. No, it's supposed to come automatically, just naturally. Look, imagine you're in love with somebody. Well, <laughs> with your wife or your husband, whatever. But I'm just saying, 
you want to give them something, not because you know they're going to be mad if you didn't get it for whatever, the anniversary, the husband, the wife, the, the birthday, whatever. No, simply because you love to see them happy. You love to see them enjoy things. You love to see them, you know, there's no strings attached. It isn't like, you know, now you owe me and, you know, so. No, it's just simply because of your love for them, you want to see them happy. No different than we do for grandkids and stuff. They're not earning anything. We're just doing it. You see something, you think, oh, I'll bet this one would really like that because they're into this thing or that thing. And you get it. And you're not expecting them to earn it. You got it because you just thought of them immediately and wanted to do something for them. That's God. That's the way God does it. And he wants us to respond to him in the same way. Now, I owe God 30 minutes of prayer, or I owe God to give up this thing, or I owe God to not ever do that. No, we, we don't want to be evil. But on the other hand, we want to be able to come to God with worship, with prayer, with time that we want to communicate with him simply out of the fact that we love him. Just because he's good. And we appreciate it, right? So our good works ought to be an expression of our just abiding in Jesus. The branch doesn't try to bear fruit. It can't. It's totally dependent on receiving this life-giving fluid from the vine. Now, what did Jesus say? He said, uh, if you come to me, you'll never thirst again. Right? And out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Right? So when we abide in Christ, our works are a natural outflow of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's natural. You don't have to work up a bunch of stuff you got to do. You just go and live your life, and out of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, it will flow out. You, you'll have opportunities to share with people. You'll have opportunities to talk with grandchildren, with children, with neighbors, with friends, with somebody at Walmart, who knows where. Wherever you are, that will pour out of you as a result of you abiding in him. Praise the Lord. So the Holy Spirit flows through us. Just as the sap in a tree flows up through the trunk and eventually into the branches and produces whatever fruit that tree produces. Hebrews 6 and 9. We read this just a little bit ago, but I want to go back to it for a moment just to show you something here. Hebrews 6 and 9, it says, For, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Now he's talked about these Jews who are going back, reverting back to, to uh, Judaism and to the ritual of the law. But he said, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So he's saying, I'm telling you all this stuff, but I'm expecting better from you because you've been born again. I'm, not ex I'm expecting you to just trust God and not keep going back to this religious mumbo-jumbo, right? And he, so he's explaining to us our good works are natural in that they are a result of salvation. If you know what salvation was. If you know that salvation was more than just you going to heaven when you die. Salvation, sozo, it's all the things. You're, you're blessed with everything that God has provided for us. Amen? Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. <clears throat> Hebrews 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. God already knows what works he's got in you for you to do. But the only way for you to do them is by the Holy Spirit, by abiding in if we abide in him, as Jesus abides in the Father, and you know when he's here on earth as a man, if we abide in him that way, then we will bear much fruit. In other words, the, the fruit that God intended to be born of us will happen. Right? That's what he's telling us. If, if you abide in me, right, and I abide in you, you're going to bear much fruit. Not because you're trying to bear much fruit, but just simply because of the fullness of what salvation has brought to you, the result is overflow. It's like Abraham. God said, I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing. So he blesses us with grace and with all the goodness of God so that we can share grace and the goodness of God with everybody else. That's all. Just simple, right? 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, 
there's liberty. That, I mean, based on my coming through religion, that was like a contradiction. I mean, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And we thought there was fear, a place to hide, correction. You know? All right, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Here. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. We ought to be liberated. Amen? Liberated from what? From religion, from the rules, from the regulations, from the demands of the law. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works. Why? Because they're dead works. As God did from his. They were finished. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Praise the Lord. So when we understand the perfection that's given to us in Christ, through the remission of sins, the gift of God's righteousness, we can stop performing, amen, for God's acceptance. We can stop working to get his approval. We can live everlastingly in the acceptance of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we receive the revelation of our perfection through Jesus, take us to 1 John 4, 17. Once we have this revelation of our perfection in Christ or through the work of Jesus, herein is our love made perfect that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. We find that as we are in the mind of God, we can be in this world. Praise the Lord. Our spirit and Christ's spirit are united in perfect union, indivisible. Cannot be divided. Cannot be separated. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3.17 again. Herein is our love made perfect that we have... Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen? When we walk in liberty, we walk in the Spirit. We stop performing, and we enter into God's rest, into the finished work of Jesus. Hebrews 4.11. Their unbelief kept them out, so he said, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The unbelief here is referring to our striving to win the approval of God, which Christ has already given to us through his blood. The blood of Christ has made us perfect vessels of honor, useful in God's hands for every good work. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9, 14 again. We'll wrap it up here. So he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through? Now he's talking about if the blood of bulls and goats would keep the judgment of God off of you from year to year, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Purge your conscience from dead works. He's saying, let the Holy Spirit breathe liberty and freedom into your life through the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Praise God. Last scripture, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. What's written, curse is everyone that hangs on the tree. That the blessing of What was the blessing of Abraham? His faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham screwed up just like we do. And yet God said, he's my man. He's my friend. You mess with him, you mess with me. I'm blessing him so that he can be a blessing. Everywhere his foot he steps. Amen. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What is the promise of the Spirit? What did he say? 
where the spirit is, there's liberty. Why? Abram had liberty. He didn't know he didn't, the law didn't come for another 400 and some years. All he knew was the love of God. All he knew was the liberty of God. I mean, he's, I mean, he does crazy stuff. And I mean, even like after the, we've talked about this many times, but it just blows my mind to think about when Abram had given his sister, wife, to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh took her into his harem. Now, he didn't have relationships with her, but she was going through the process of being prepared for that. And God came to the Pharaoh in a dream and said, if you, let that, if you touch that woman, you're dead. You get her back to my prophet, or you're going to die. And the Pharaoh's thinking, the, your prophet, your prophet's the one that lied to me and said it was her sister, his sister and took a bunch of money for her. That's your man? And God said that you turn her loose, and I'll have him pray for you. Now, i got to tell you, a dream like that come to me? I'm thinking that was right from the pits of hell. That came from, you know, that came from the pizza. Well, how could God say that? Because he saw Abram as perfect. Why? Because he believed God. And I'm telling you, when we look at these people, David, and over and over through the scriptures, that's how God was dealing with it. That's why David was a man after God's own heart, because he understood the love and the grace of God, even though he didn't live in a dispensation where it was available on the same level that it would be today. He believed that God was good and that God blessed his people. Tim says it all the time. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. We are righteous. of the spirit. Liberty. The curse is broken. We are redeemed. We are the offspring of God. We are free. As he is, so are we in this world. In Jesus' name, give him a hand. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you all being here this morning. Let's walk in the liberty and the freedom that God has given us so that we can share the love of God to other people, not the fear, not the torment, not the, the anxiety, but the love and the favor of God. This world needs it desperately, now more than ever before. In Jesus' name, let's, let's share him genuinely, not religiously, in the name of Jesus. God bless you again. God, have a great week. See you back here next week.